Welcome to Season 4 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak with David Marchek, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. government agency that serves as America's development bank. We talk about some big loans the U.S. government is making to support COVID vaccine production in developing countries. Let's listen. David Marchek, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. You are the Chief Operating Officer at the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. I understand that's known as the DFC. Correct. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm not sure many of our listeners know what the DFC does. Could you introduce um, the agency to us? Sure. Well, thank you very much, Josh, for hosting. I've been an admirer of your work for many years, and uh, you've done a great service to our country on a range of public health issues, and I'm just delighted to, to be with you. So the International Development Finance Corporation is America's development bank. And we were created by Congress in 2019, the first year was 2020, to advance American interests through development and through using development financing of private sector entities, private sector activity, to advance America's development goals and also to advance U.S. foreign policy objectives. So we finance projects all over the world, but heavily in Africa, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia to help create economic activity, to help drive health and prosperity, and to help advance American interests abroad. So could you give me an example of something, say, pre-pandemic that the DFC has made possible? Well, let me give you an example of something that we just announced, which we would do regardless of the the pandemic, which is um, we have four significant priorities under President Biden's leadership in a program called Build Back Better for the World. That is advancing our climate interests to deal with the climate crisis, global health, supporting gender equity, which really comes down to supporting women-run, women-owned, or businesses that have significant number of women managers. Uh, And then finally, technology. We know that technology is a critical tool for lifting people's lives, enabling them to have more access to information and improve the quality of their lives. So last week, we announced a transaction in Rio de Janeiro to help the city of Rio essentially create a smart city. So our financing is going to support a private sector company that is going to replace all the lights in Rio de Janeiro with LED lighting, which lowers the cost for electricity for the city. It lowers emissions. And they're also creating Wi-Fi stations at many of these lighting posts where people across the city of Rio de Janeiro can go up and have access to the Wi-Fi. And in Rio, that's really important because there are a lot of folks at the lower end of the economic spectrum in Rio, I don't know if you've been there, that don't have access to Wi-Fi, don't have broadband. And so this investment is a great example of how we can not only help a developing country develop, but it can also improve people's lives by lowering emissions and by giving them access to technology. And that's, uh, that's fascinating. I imagine you have quite an interesting job. It's a great agency. My job is really to support the agency. We have around 430 people here, most of whom are career public servants. And the most important part of my job is to support those career public servants to enable, give them the space to do their job effectively, to support them and then get out of the way, which I think is the, is the role of any good leader. So your job also has involved responding to the pandemic, and that's why I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, It sounds like the DFC has been deeply involved in the vaccine against uh, COVID-19. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Well, as you know, President Biden has really led the world to work to end the pandemic 
in 2022. That's the goal. Um, there have been numerous elements of the strategy to end the pandemic, including supporting the manufacture and distribution of vaccines in the United States, including donating more than 1.2 billion doses of vaccines to the developing world, of which I think around 250 million have been shipped already. And then our role at the DFC has been to finance both the manufacturing and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Let me just try to lay out the problem that we're trying to solve. Prior to the onset of the pandemic, global capacity for all vaccines was around 5 billion doses. That's for all vaccines. So yellow fever, polio, influenza, et cetera. We know that in order to vaccinate 70% of the world's population, which is the president's goal by, the, by around September of next year, so the fall of next year, we need around 11 doses, 11 million billion doses. Um, and because of the need for boosters, we're going to need that capacity for the long term. So there is a need in the world to have significantly more capacity to manufacture vaccines. We also know that the poorest countries in the world have not have had access to the vaccines in the same pace or volume as rich countries. And so we've really been focused on providing financing to support vaccine manufacturing in the developing world. So far, we've invested in three companies, one in India and two in Africa, and we're looking at others as well. So it sounds like one of your short-term goals is to stand up more manufacturing capacity in developing countries. Um, is that done in partnership with existing uh, companies that are making vaccines, or is that done separately from existing companies? So great questions. We have primarily focused on partnering with vaccine manufacturing companies in South Africa, India, Senegal, who have relationships with existing manufacturers of vaccines. So, for example, Johnson & Johnson has partnered with a company in South Africa called Aspen Pharmacare. And Aspen is working to produce somewhere in the range of 500 million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccines between now and the end of 2022, made in Africa for Africa. In India, we're supporting a company called Biological E, and they also are partnering with Johnson & Johnson. They also have partnered with Baylor University in Texas, which not only is a great basketball school, but also a great center for excellence in, in biotechnology. And they've developed their own vaccine with Baylor, which is working its way through regulatory approval right now. And pending regulatory approval, they would be manufacturing and producing a significant number of those doses as well. How big are these investments that you're making? So the one in South Africa, we partnered with the IFC, which is the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank. And then our counterparts in Germany and France, and combined, it's a 600 million euro loan, which is around 730, 750 million dollars. So it's quite substantial. It's the largest healthcare loan any of the entities have been involved in. To put it in perspective, over the last five years, pre-pandemic, the DFC or its predecessor agency, on average, invested around 125 million dollars in healthcare. So we have significantly ramped up our healthcare activity commensurate with the challenges the world faces in the pandemic. Let me ask you this. When you talk about a loan of $700, $800 million, does the company on the other end of the loan have to pay it back? What's the advantage to them? Yes, they have to pay it back. These are U.S. taxpayer dollars that uh, we are protecting. Obviously, we have two goals. We want to advance development interests and support developing countries. But we also want to protect U.S. taxpayer dollars. So we have very, very detailed underwriting standards. And the agency's never lost money in, an, in any year it's been in existence. Why is this important? So vaccine manufacturing companies in developing countries have not had adequate access to capital. And so the capital we're providing will help them build new facilities, increase capacity, be able to train their people better, and they can use the money to invest in capacity, not only to help end this pandemic, but equally importantly, to help ensure that they're prepared to answer the challenges for the next health crisis that we face. 
And they'll use this capacity not only to produce COVID-19 vaccines, but also for other vaccines that the, that the world needs, not only in Africa, but also everywhere around the world. Got it. Would it be fair to assume that these companies would have a hard time finding a loan like that absent the support from an agency like DSC? Yes. Our role is to provide financing where there's the, the normal capital markets, the private markets don't work to fulfill a government objective. Here, the government objective is ending the pandemic. So this is money well invested and money that will save lives. How much of a change in orientation is this work from, say, the work that was done before the Biden administration came on board? So this is a significant focus. The president has asked all of his government that he's leading to stretch and do anything possible to end the pandemic. So again, in the health space, the DFC, we just finished our fiscal year, which ends September 30th of every year. And this year, we invested five and a half times the previous annual average in healthcare spending for the agency, not only in vaccine manufacturing, but we also provided, for example, political risk insurance to Gavi to be able to ship doses to nine upper middle income countries. And we also provided financing for an insurance product, which provides insurance to shippers, truckers, et cetera, so that they have confidence they can get insurance to, to transport vaccine doses. So if there's a crash or a truck rolls over and, and doses are spoiled, that those entities have insurance. And that helps give them confidence to carry the doses in developing countries um, so that the, the doses can get distributed. You did mention a phrase called political risk insurance that I'm not too familiar with, but sometimes I feel like I, I need to buy it myself if I don't know whether that's something I can buy. But um, when you say political risk insurance, and I think you said it in the context of Gavi, which um, is a major provider of, of vaccines, um, what, did, what, what do you mean when you say that DFC gets political risk insurance to help countries get vaccinated? So one can buy insurance for almost any product. You can buy life insurance, you can buy car insurance, you can buy insurance for your house. DFC and its predecessor, predecessor agency called OPIC, the Overseas Developed Private uh, Investment Corporation, provides something called political risk insurance, which gives companies or non-governmental entities insurance against certain activities like expropriation or confiscation of assets by a government or non-payment of an arbitral award. So if there's a dispute, one can go to arbitration. And if a country does not pay the arbitral award, we, we provide insurance to cover that risk. And so it's a type of insurance that we provide, the private sector also provides it, and the World Bank provides it, to reduce risk for companies and investors to, to do business in developing countries. In many developing countries, you know, it's not like doing business in Switzerland or the United States where there's strong rule of law, access to courts, stability. And so it's more risk. And the United States has a deep strategic national security and economic interest in supporting developing countries. And this is a tool that the United States uses to help support investment in those countries to help lift lives and ultimately advance our foreign policy objectives. So looking forward to 20. 22 and beyond, do you think this increased investment in global health is going to stick for DFC? Do you see new opportunities? Are you still looking to invest more money perhaps in, in 2022? I can think of all kinds of places in the supply chain which might benefit from an investment like this. How, how do you think about it? So we, we are interested in continuing to be very, very active in health. We have something called the Health and Prosperity Initiative, where we want to catalyze investment in support of global health resilience. So that's not only working in the area to deal with the pandemic, but also in healthcare facilities, in healthcare delivery, in healthcare products. It's helping hospitals or medical clinics in developing countries gain access to financing. And it also provides... Um, we also provide financing to help small and medium-sized enterprises 
uh, increase their activity in the healthcare space and, and increase uh, access to healthcare. So in lots of lots of parts of the world, there's just inadequate healthcare supply and healthcare delivery systems, and we want to use our tools to advance healthcare interests around the world. Well, um, David Marchek, thank you so much for explaining that mission and uh, giving some very interesting details about COVID vaccine financing here on Public Health On Call. Thanks so much for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.